The use of mobile devices for educational purposes inside and outside of the classroom has grown drastically in popularity in recent years. At the same time, concerns over screen time, the use of social media, and even the rapidly accelerating rates of teen suicide, along with device addiction, have also come to the fore. Some have suggested or implied there's a causal relationship between the two, but is there research to back up such a claim? This week on EdTechnically, we're going to ask, does mobile learning lead to mobile addiction? To begin, the advent of mobile addiction is very real. It is identified using similar criteria to other behavioral addictions like gambling and video games. The authors of a 2016 NCBI study using DSM-5 criteria for addiction provide a table of symptoms that indicate mobile addiction. A quick Google search reveals hundreds of investigations conducted by academics, journalists, and others into the advent of mobile addiction, and an overwhelming amount confirm its presence. A 2014 study conducted by a team led by Olatz Lopez Fernandez found that 10% of UK youths aged 11 to 14 displayed mobile addiction. For Indian learners of the same age, the figure stood somewhere between 39 and 44%. The negative effects can fall broadly into three different categories, social, physiological, and psychological. This is not the place to look for an exhaustive list, but to highlight the effects of mobile addiction in a 2015 survey of Alabama University students, a majority strongly agreed with the following statements. These statements are, I feel safer when I have my phone with me. I sleep with my phone within arm's reach. I would panic if I lost my phone. I would be upset if I left my phone at home. I often find that I use my phone longer than I had intended. I never turn off my phone. I feel disconnected when I do not have my phone. I need my phone at all times. I would feel alone without my phone. I think I hear my phone even when it makes no sound, and by the way, this happens to me all the time. And because I am afraid I am going to miss something, I regularly check my phone. I use my phone as a way of escaping from problems or relieving a bad mood. We as a society have grown so attached to our phones in some cases that psychologists have a word for the anxiety one feels without it. Nomophobia, as in the fear of no more phone. Potentially more troubling, the rate of teen suicide ideation, which means having thoughts about suicide, along with attempts, has drastically increased in the past few years. Health professionals still don't know why, but some have speculated that social media and mobile phone use are to blame. One thing, however, is clear. Rates are far higher while school is in session. While device addiction is a known and identified issue, many schools provide mobile devices and even encourage phone use in class for educational purposes. And there's a good reason for that. They can really enhance the educational experience. Mobile devices allow students to use amazing technology in class. Last school year, John Singali, a social studies teacher at the Vancouver iTech Preparatory School, which is located in Vancouver, Washington, partnered with the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site to bring his class into photograph museum artifacts to turn them into 3D objects that people can view online. Classes routinely use mobile devices along with highly affordable VR headsets to visit other places in the world or enter virtual environments. GeoGebra, one of the world's most widely used math apps, recently created an AR component which allows students to replicate and graph real-world objects. There are countless incredible ways teachers are currently using mobile devices in the classroom. Earlier in November of 2018, John Landis, who heads the education department at Apple, a company that just put out a classroom-focused iPad last year along with numerous existing mobile learning initiatives, took the stage at the State Education Technology Directors Association conference. He said that mobile learning is, quote, shifting the paradigm, unquote, of K-12 education. As he continued, uh, according to EdScoop, quote, this is about holding students accountable to the world that they are growing up in, and more importantly, the world they're going to be in. Their future is not the same as ours was growing up. It's remarkably different. 
And it's not just what we're using to teach, it's how we're teaching and who." End quote. So are these remarks misplaced? Is handing a mobile device to a young learner like buying them their first pack of cigarettes or sitting down with them in front of a slot machine? A few teams of researchers have already asked this question. In 2017, professors Neil Davey and Tobias Hilber surveyed a body of 104 students at South Westphalia University of Applied Science in, I do not know how to pronounce the name of this town, Meschede, Germany. Meshed? Meschede? Every single one of the students surveyed owned a smartphone and 99% said they regularly had their devices with them in class. 95% furthermore said they used their smartphones for educational purposes either in or out of class. The majority of respondents, uh, 60 in total, were found to be mildly nomophobic. 41 had a moderate case of the anxiety, and just 3 were found to have severe nomophobia, but no students had no trace of the anxiety. This leads the authors to conclude that, quote, nomophobia is a serious problem for only a small group of students, end quote. A 2013 study provides an alternative by looking instead at students' attitudes toward mobile supplemented learning at a secondary school in the UK that had provided learners with Apple iPod Touch devices. The researchers simultaneously compared these perspectives to learners at another school where mobile use is expressly forbidden. The study involved several different means of collecting information, including an online survey, diary entries, and in-class observation and interviews. 325 learners answered the online survey while significantly fewer journaled or participated in an interview. The school that encouraged mobile use was called Academy M, while the other was called Academy A. The researchers unearthed many unexpected findings. To begin, they found that even though the devices were banned at Academy A, 43% of learners reported still bringing them in anyway, and using them for learning purposes. A much larger percentage likely brought them in for covert extracurricular use. Meanwhile, 73% of respondents at Academy M used their devices for education, and it, that was a figure that administrators at the school had hoped would be higher. Use of devices for educational purposes spanned a wide range of categories, including listening to podcasts, watching videos, using a calendar or planning app, emailing, and accessing the internet. When asked, how much do you feel a mobile device helps your learning? The overwhelming majority at both schools answered either a bit or a lot. This was roughly 70% at Academy A and 85% at Academy M. A slightly smaller majority of both schools also believe that devices should be used in class. As one student put it, quote, without this iPad, I don't think I would be where I am right now because it's helped me hugely with all my stuff. When we never used to have this, I'll be honest, I was on grade Ds. But now, because I've got this, I'm on grade As and Bs. It's a great opportunity." End quote. The authors conclude by writing, quote, There is clear evidence that many pupils feel that they are deriving educational benefits from the use of their devices. They are using many of the features of their devices and often finding creative ways to employ these features in their schoolwork, both at home and at school. The findings raise questions for secondary leadership and educators in those schools which still impose a ban. Is it necessary? End quote. The two studies above, therefore, indicate that device use in the classroom is mostly beneficial, but at the same time, they rely on very small sample sizes to land on these conclusions, and they're also getting more and more out of date. Much more investigation is needed into the subject and there is still much we do not know. This has been Ed Technically. My name is Henry Kronk, and I work as editor of eLearning Inside. If you liked this episode, please rate and review. If you want to hear more, please subscribe. Also, keep in mind that this show is available as a video on our YouTube channel and also as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. 
The basic content for this video first appeared as an article on eLearning Inside, and if you want to learn more about online courses, technology in the classroom, and edtech in general, be sure to check out our site. It's updated every day. If you would like to get in touch with me, please send me an email at henry at elearninginside.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at elearninginside. Thanks for listening.